you know, thank you, thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm Will Martin, I'm the, the president of the Energy Club uh, here at Johnson, and uh, this is a topic I've been interested in uh, for a few years. Um, it's definitely a very contentious topic, as, as we were saying, there's a lot of strong opinions about it. Um, so today we're, we're gonna have uh, Chris Martinson, who's a uh, former Johnson, or he's a Johnson alum, uh, and he's, he's a, one of the foremost experts on peak oil. He's, he's written a book and a, created a movie called uh, The Crash Course, and so he'll be calling in in about 20 minutes to talk with us uh, about the topic and answer questions. So first of all, just to uh, define peak oil, peak oil is the point at which you reach a maximum rate in uh, daily production of global oil. Uh, so a lot of people, when they think of peak oil, uh, they think of, you know, we're running out of oil, um, or we're half gone with the oil we have, and, and those are close, but really it's all about the rate of production. Um, so you can think of it in supply and demand terms as sort of a supply ceiling uh, to oil production. So going into you know, how this occurs, uh, oil fields by themselves, just due to the geology in the field, all follow sort of a bell-shaped curve, and it's sort of a modified curve that's a little bit steeper on the front and has sort of a long tail. Uh, and, and what happens is when you start drilling for a field, the first well, you discover that the field's productive, and then you start drilling more and more wells into the field. You reach a point where you can't get any more production out of the field just due to the geology of the field. If you try to pull any more oil out of it, you damage the field. So all oil fields reach a peak and then begin to decline as far as the production goes. You can aggregate these across um, states. So on the left, there's Alaska and Texas, uh, which have both peaked. Uh, you know, you can aggregate all those fields, and then you can aggregate the fields, you know, from all of our states in the U.S. to see the production curve for the United States, which peaked back in 1971. So we've added. You can see uh, offshore drilling as well as Alaskan oil, where they built the pipeline to bring it down. But the this did increase our oil production, but it didn't increase the oil production enough to make up for the decline of the depleting fields. And so you can take that one step further. Uh, you can aggregate all of the uh, countries in the world to a global oil production uh, curve. And so this is one of the estimates of, of a peak oil curve from uh, Energy Files. They estimated peak oil somewhere around 2015. Um, and I'll go into sort of the estimates in a second. So the reason this happens, uh, and the reason sort of it's an, an inevitability that we're gonna reach peak oil is, is due to the, the discovery peak. So globally, back in 1965, we reached a peak in the amount of, of barrels of oil discovered. And ever since then, we haven't been finding uh, as, as many barrels of oil per year in reserves as we did back in the 60s. And it got to a point where in the 1990s, we were producing more oil than we were discovering every year. Uh, and to today, where we produce about twice as much oil every day to, as the oil that we discover. So these are some of the estimates um, from, from various agencies. Uh, on the le so on the x-axis here, this is the, the year uh, that people are predicting the global peak in oil production. Uh, the, on sort of the, the Worst case scenario side, uh, people like Colin Campbell think that we've already reached peak <coughs> in oil production. Um, Univer University of Uppsala in, in Sweden has sort of a range that in includes right now, maybe up to 2015. Energy Files, uh, which I showed you, thinks about 2015. And then the sort of more optimistic uh, projections are, are from companies like Shell that uh, still agree that we'll have peak oil, but they think it'll happen sometime you know, 15 years from now, maybe. Um, on the y-axis is <coughs> the, the depletion rate of, of the global oil production after we reach the peak. And again, there's a huge range, everywhere from sort of 1% to 7%. And if you, if you think about what a 7% depletion rate means, if you use the rule of 70, that means that every 10 years, it would have a half-life of 10 years. So every 10 years, we would have half as much oil as we did 10 years ago. So if we had peak oil today with a 70% depletion rate 10 years from now, we'd have half the oil production that we do today, which, which would be essentially catastrophic. Uh, but then going all the way down to sort of a 1% depletion rate estimate, that's something that you know we could more easily transition over to the alternatives. So to talk about uh, you know 
how this works sort of in, in supply and demand terms. Uh, when you reach peak in oil production, you have a kinked supply curve. So you have essentially a, a ceiling of available supply of production. And what happens is, so, so it's essentially a curve that, that becomes extremely inelastic after a certain point, and that's, that's the peak production point. Um, what happens is as you, and this is sort of a short run demand curve. So as, as you shift out demand, say as you know, China or, or Asia increases their demand as everybody starts driving more cars, uh, you, you get into this uh, point where it's, it's very inelastic demand, you get a price spike and, and the prices go very high but there's not the corresponding uh, increase in, in supply going to market. And so if, we, if we're past the peak and that occurs over, over a long term, that was a short term supply and demand curve over the long term if we have very high prices, we start switching over to substitutes. Uh, so one way to think about this is, is uh, from the grid parity standpoint, if you're looking at electricity production uh, and we have ever increasing prices of non-renewable resources like coal and gas to create electricity, um, at some point they're going to reach the price that renewable energy production is. And so renewable energy production is flat because there are no input costs and actually over the long term it's decreasing as we get better at manufacturing uh, solar panels and manufacturing wind turbines. So that inflection point is known as grid parity, and essentially, you know, once once the price goes up to that point, it'll switch over to the substitutes, and you know, we'll all be running on, on renewable energy basically. Now, there's a lot of problems with switching over, so that's that's where all of this uh, worry and discussion comes in about peak oil. Uh, first and foremost, just just the fungibility of the substitutes. Um, electricity is not a, a a liquid transportation fuel and so what we're reaching is a peak in oil production which we use to produce liquid transportation fuels. We have trillions of dollars in infrastructure, uh, in planes and trains and cars and trucks and ships that all run on liquid transportation fuel. So switching over that trillions of dollars in infrastructure to something that would run on electricity uh, would, would be you know, a tremendous undertaking. And if we had a very fast depletion rate, uh, it would be very difficult to switch over uh, to, the, to, that, to those new production uh, or those, those new transportation uh, infrastructure styles. And at the same time, if we have ever increasing demand for this energy, um, it, it would you know, amplify that, that effect. And then there's sort of the limits to scale of ramping up all these substitutes. So if you look at our current global energy mix, we have uh, the vast, vast majority of, of our world's energy is non-renewable finite natural resources like coal, oil, or natural gas. Uh, so if we have, and, and the renewable energy that we do have is, is an extremely small percentage of our world energy mix. So if we have, say, a 3% annual decline in the availability of oil, um, we wouldn't have to ramp up renewables by 3%, we'd have to ramp them up by 300%, 3,000%. Uh, and to do, you know, a ramp up of, say, wind by 3,000% in one year uh, would, would be essentially infeasible. Um, while even if you could do it, at the same time, you'd be running into all of these other uh, limits to scale issues. So, you know, the first is NIMBY. This is not in my backyard. People around here in Ithaca, if you walk around, you'll see a lot of these uh, no fracking signs. So people are, are very worried about, um, that gas fracking will, will pollute their groundwater, so people don't want drilling in their backyard. And, and sort of likewise with nuclear, uh, a lot of people don't want to have a nuclear reactor in their backyard. Wind, uh, famously the Kennedys didn't want to have wind off, off Nantucket because it ruined their view. Uh, and then the same sort of coal uh, mountaintop removal, if you live in a place that has nice mountains, you might be opposed to them blowing them up and taking them away. So. Uh, then with the renewable energy, there's all kinds of problems with variability and intermittency. Um, the wind uh, doesn't blow all the time, and it's not sunny at night, so we can't uh, use these, these re renewable resources by themselves. Uh, to deal with the variability problem, you have to have a, a huge uh, supply base. Say if we're going to rely on wind, we can't just rely on the maximum production of each turbine. We have to have you know, three or four times as many turbines. To, to take care of that variability. 
And then for inter intermittency, uh, we have to have other forms of energy to, as a base load to take up that intermittency. And then location availability. So we basically used all of the good hydropower uh, areas. All, we've basically dammed all the, all the good places already in, in the Western world. Um, with wind, we certainly haven't you know, reached the limit of uh, wind production, but you know, eventually we'll reach the point where there just aren't uh, enough wind sites left that, that have you know, high amounts of wind. So there is a limit to that as well. And then biofuels, you know, if today we wanted to switch over all of our gasoline production in the U.S. to biofuels, uh, we would have to use every single acre of our uh, cropland that we use to produce food. I'll take questions after this. And, uh, you know, we'd all starve to death. So that's, those are the limits to uh, the scale and ramp up. This is a chart. So I was actually this week going back and forth on email um, with Professor Ben Ho, who was here at Cornell last semester. He was uh, George W. Bush's uh, former chief energy economist, and he and I sort of disagree over whether we I should put this in. He, he seems to think this is irrelevant, but I'll, I'll talk through it. Um, net energy is basically how, many, how much energy did you expend to get energy out. And so 100 years ago, uh, when we started drilling for oil, you'd, you'd burn a barrel of oil to be drilling into the ground, and you'd get 100 barrels back. Uh, today, with uh, the offshore drilling, you know you have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to create this incredibly complex oil rig that you then float out to sea and drill in 10,000 feet of water. And because of all that energy that you've expended, you get something like 10 to 20, 30 barrels of oil back for every <coughs> barrel of oil that you expended. Um, as we switch into the substitutes, things like biofuels, tar sands, wind, solar, um, they all have lower energy return on energy invested than the current oil that we're producing right now. And this, this goes into what's called this receding horizons problem. So everyone talks about shale oil. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly large resource from a, from a resource base perspective, um, but it has a very low net energy return. So, you know, 10 years ago, everyone's saying, we'll just switch over to shale oil. And then, t you know, it's been 10 years and everyone's saying 10 years from now, we'll switch over to shale oil. It's always 10 years away because it's, it, you just don't get enough energy um, out of it. And so the, the argument against this um, that, that Ben Ho uh, came up with and we talked about is, you know, we have, you can essentially take any of these energy resources and turn them into a useful form of energy. So in Norway, um, Norsk Hydro takes uh, uh, hydropower and they turn it into fertilizer. Uh, for, you know, for growing their crops in Norway. So you could take hydropower, turn it into fertilizer, grow crops with it, turn it into ethanol, and essentially what you've done is turned hydropower into a very useful liquid transportation fuel. Um, as long as it's net energy positive, uh, Ben Ho would argue that, that there's, there's really no problem with it. It would just be very expensive. And so that goes into the cost. Um, all of the alternatives to liquid transportation fuels to, to oil, um, things like uh, gas to liquid, syn syn fuels, um, coal to liquids, tar sands, they're all, uh, they all cost a lot more to produce. And then of course uh, there's the environmental limits uh, to the substitutes. So these will limit the scale that you can go to but then they also limit the ramp up speed. Um, for tar sands, uh, it, it used a lot of water to produce tar sands up, up in the Athabasca tar sands in Alberta. Um, it uses about 35 mm -hmm. gallons of fresh water for every gallon of oil that's produced up there. And so they get all their oil from a river known as the Peace River, uh, and they're essentially reaching the limits of how much water they can pull out of the river without running it dry. Uh, that is a limit to their scale. Obviously, you can increase the efficiency and recycle the water, but there's still a limit to the, to the amount of production you can get on a, on a barrels per day basis. Uh, they're also limited by the amount of uh, natural gas available to them, which they use to heat up uh, the tar sands to get the oil out. Um, you know, there's only so much natural gas and there's a limit to the amount of production they can get up there. To the point where now they're talking about building nuclear reactors in Alberta to provide the, the energy um, to heat the tar sands. And uh, you know, that's just another limit to, to some of these resources. Things like uh, shale, uh, oil shale, and uh, coal to liquids. Again, as I mentioned, there's, there's limits to scale. 
uh, you know, there's only so many resources and, and you can only do so much, uh, you know, strip mining and mock truck removal to, to turn these resources in, into useful liquid transportation fuels. And then there's, uh, you know, all the environmental effects of going to these substitutes. So greenhouse gas emissions from tar sands are, uh, you know, much higher than, than the current greenhouse gas emissions from, from conventional oil, mostly due to the fact that it requires so much extra processing, you have to burn natural gas, um, and then there's extra transportation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we go over to coal to liquids, so you can actually turn coal into a synthetic diesel um, that you can run your truck on, it's, it, but it produces a tremendous amount of greenhouse gas. So, you know, this is something as a society we have to decide, um, you know, is this something we're comfortable with switching to these alternatives uh, that, are, that have much higher greenhouse gas emissions. And then there's all the sort of other environmental effects of these substitutes. So these are all the externalities that when we think of substitutes. Um, obviously, with with oil, we have uh, offshore drilling. We have we have oil spills like the Deepwater Horizon. Um, with tar sands, there's there's water pollution. So the Athabasca tar sands. You, you take those 35 gallons of water that you took for every gallon of gasoline you made, or gallon of crude oil you made. Um, and you have to put that water somewhere. And so the, what they do is they put them into tailing ponds and they've, they've grown to such a massive scale that you can actually see the Athabasca tailing ponds from space now. Um, that's sort of a limit uh, and, and it's, it's a huge amount of, of pollution that they're eventually gonna have to deal with that hasn't really been priced in. That's why it's an externality. Um, then with shale gas, the reason why people around here are worried about it is because there's the possibility that it can contaminate groundwater. So it's, a, it's an externality. And what you can take, one way to look at this with externalities is that these are prices that are not included in the price you pay for these resources. So when you buy um, oil made from tar sands, you're not really paying for the cleanup cost of these tailing ponds 30 years from now. Um, the government of, of Canada is gonna have to pay for that. And if you included all of the additional costs from these externalities into these substitutes, these prices of substitutes, um, you know, you might find that it's just not worth it to go to these substitutes. And so, all right, so that's, that's you know, the general, what I just went through is we're, we're going to reach peak oil at some point. It's going to force us to switch to substitutes to continue to increase our, our uh, the amount of energy we use worldwide, but there's all kinds of problems with these substitutes. And, and so it might prevent us from uh, replacing that oil on a one-to-one -one basis with, uh, with substitutes. So why is this a problem? Um, it's, a, it's a problem mostly because we, re we rely on oil for everything. So you know, as George Bush said, we're addicted to oil. Um, one way to look at this you know, is to look around this room and every single thing in this room is either made of oil, uh, was produced with oil, or was transported here using oil. And so we use liquid transportation fuels, you know, 80% of it obviously goes to liquid transportation fuels from oil, um, gasoline drive a car, diesel will drive trucks and trains and jet fuel for airplanes. Um, but then 20% of it goes to essentially everything we use, everything that's plastic, uh, you know, your toothbrush that you brushed your teeth with this morning, hopefully, um, you know, you have rubber in your car's tires, the asphalt in the road that you drive on, these are all made from oil. And so if, we're reach, if we reach a price or if we reach a supply ceiling and we start having ever decreasing amounts of this and ever increasing prices, basically the price of everything we use uh, goes up. And so the, what's, you know, the, the sort of scariest thing uh, about this, what the price could go up on that, that would really affect all of us because it's you know, the necessity for life is the price of food. And so the, one, one of the common statistics that people talk about um, when talking about food is that uh, for every calorie of food you eat uh, in, in the Western world, we've expended 10 calories of hydrocarbon fuel to create that calorie of food. And, and the way this works is you think about ever since the Green Revolution, the way we've mechanized food production in the world, um, we, we've essentially gotten to a point where now to produce every every food on your plate you have to uh, take natural gas to create fertilizer you have to take oil to create pesticides you run your combines and tractors on diesel fuel 
um, then you take you know the raw commodities and, and truck it to a processing plant. You use energy at the processing plant to turn it into food. Truck it to a supermarket. You get in your car and burn gasoline. Go to the supermarket, pick up the food, bring it home, and eat it. And by the time you've done all that, you know you've, you've expended 10 calories of hydrocarbon fuel uh, for the calorie food you ate. And, and you know another statistic here is that it takes uh, six barrels of oil to raise one steer. And so what this means is, you know, in, in the Western world, uh, in places like the U.S., we're not going to starve to death. Um, food prices are going to go up, but we're still going to be able to afford them. What this is a problem for is, is people that are already spending half their money on food right now. If the price of food doubles, they're in really big trouble. And, and this could mean, you know, that people will starve to death, essentially. Um, this, this is sort of one of the, the biggest, scariest issues about people that, that people often talk about. And so another effect of peak oil is just like oil is a finite and non-renewable natural resource, so are the other hydrocarbon fuels that we use, like gas and coal. They're, they're all finite, they're all non-renewable. Um, and just like oil, eventually they'll, they'll reach a peak, we'll have peak coal eventually, we'll have peak gas eventually. Um, but what happens is when you reach peak oil and you start substituting in these other uh, resources for oil, it accelerates the peak, so it brings it forward. Um, <coughs> the estimates are, you know, from, from people that study this, that a peak in gas could occur something like 10 to 15 years after peak in oil, and then a peak in coal something like 20 to 25 years after that. And so how does, how does this play out? What are the sort of future scenarios that this could all mean? Um, first is sort of the renewable energy techno-utopia, the Jetsons, where we all uh, drive around in, in electric cars and we drive, you know, we go on high-speed trains to go between cities. Um, and all of that is electrical powered. It's all powered by renewable energy electricity, wind and solar. Uh, the other side of the spectrum so that's the, you know, everything's great. The other side of it is we're all screwed. Uh, that's the collapsed dystopia, which, you know, this is what people are really worried about, that we would have food shortages, we'd have vastly increased food prices. Um, you know, in the U.S., 70% of our economy runs on consumer discretionary spending, so if people start spending, have to spend more money on uh, gasoline to get to work and spend more money on food to eat at their dinner table, they have less money to spend on discretionary income, things like going to the movies or going to dinner. So they take that, you know, take that out of the 70% of our economy and then we have uh, an economic depression or, or a recession. Um, and, you know, as, as countries start, uh, you know, vying for the remaining oil, we could end up uh, having, having resource wars, uh, having wars over, over oil, basically. So that's, you know, the, the very scary scenario where, where people die and, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's a very bleak future. And then there's somewhere in the middle. So somewhere in the middle um, is what a lot of analysts think is going to happen. So Deutsche Bank um, does periodic reports on peak oil. Uh, this is from their, I think their most recent report where they said, so Deutsche Bank and a lot of these analysts are basically of the view that as we reach a peak in production, we'll also reach a peak in demand. And they will move down in tandem as we switch over to substitutes. Um, so they think somewhere around 2016 we'll reach a peak in peak oil, um, and then it'll be a long, slow decline as we switch over to alternatives. Uh, as I discussed before with all the substitutes, they're not perfect. There's a lot of pains that, that will occur uh, switching over to them. So we, we may see things, excuse me. Hi, Chris. Hi, this is Chris. Hi, I'm just on the last slide. Can I finish up here? Please do. Okay. So, you know, th this um, could, could result in uh, extreme price volatility for commodities. It could result in oil price spikes and recessions, um, but then eventually we could be seeing efficiency improvements, we'd all be driving far more efficient cars, um, and we'd, have, we'd live in, you know, homes that are, are LEED certified, and uh, eventually, you know, we would switch over to, you know, electri electrification of our, of our transportation infrastructure, um, but not without severe economic pain. And so that's, those are the sort of the scenarios. Um, 
right now we have uh, Dr. Chris Martinson, who's a Johnson alum. Um, he's a foremost expert on, on peak oil and, and has written a book and created a DVD called The Crash Course, which uh, most of you have, have watched the videos I sent out. So um, without further ado, uh, here's Chris. Can you guys move in so when we ask questions we can... So who's got a question? I guess I'll start. So Chris, I, I sort of um, gave the various scenarios of, of, of how this could play out everywhere from, you know, it'll be totally fine to we, we run into, uh, you know, food shortages and resource wars, and then somewhere in the middle. Um, what, what's, your, what's your feeling on, on how this could play out? Well, the, the, what I do is I combine uh, both economic views with energy views uh, as, as the principal portion of my analysis. I also include other non-renewable natural resources um, and resources into this larger view. So the macro view is this. Um, we have an economic system that's based on a type of money we have, uh, called fiat money that's debt-based and all our money is loaned into existence. And I'm not here to give a pro or con view on that, I'm just here to describe the system. And the system has an interesting feature, which is that it's really a lot happier when it's growing than when it's shrinking. <laughs> and we all know that if we follow the news, right? You know, 2 or 3% economic growth, we can keep the, the wheels on the train. Um, and uh, with minus 2% growth, which is what we had in 2009 uh, globally, the wheels come off the train. Uh, so we clearly can, you know, we have all sorts of empirical evidence. We've got theoretical understandings that all say, listen, we've got a system that loves to grow and it hates to shrink. So that's the system. And uh, there's a lot of, of uh, thinking that goes into that view, the crash course online or in the book. I, I spent a lot of time really fleshing that view out. But since this is a, a piece around energy, um, what I want to do then is, is sort of hold that as, a, as an axiom, you know, believe it or don't, but, but we're going to hold this idea that we have an economic system that really needs to grow in order to function well. And when we step back and look into the world of energy and we put on our scientist hats for a little while and we understand things about how energy uh, can neither be created nor destroyed and uh, about how once you burn a unit of energy, it is lost, is waste heat to the universe forever, never to be recovered again. Uh, those are the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And uh, one of the things that we are running into right now as a species is the idea that we will not be able to grow our available net energy on a year-over-year -year basis going forward like we have in the past. Now, it doesn't mean complete disaster to me. It doesn't mean complete, uh, you know, an utter disruption to everything we know and love. But it simply means that how things used to operate is not something we can reliably count on, at least not prudently, not if we're in interested in managing risks, not if we're interested in really uh, establishing our companies, our businesses, our portfolios, our personal um, life choices, I think all need to take into account this idea that we are utterly 100% still to this day, economically, financially, institutionally, politically, dependent on an idea which I think <coughs> is no longer true, which is the idea that we can continually grow our energy sources, in particular petroleum. And we love petroleum because that really, I mean, it's not all energy isn't created equal. We can't say, well, if we don't have enough petroleum, we'll put some wind farms up because electrons and liquid fuels have nothing to do with each other in our, econo our economy right now. We move 95% of everything that moves from point A to point B using liquid fuels. We don't use electricity to move anything practically. It's a fraction of a percent from point A to point B. If we could reverse those things, if we did move more than 50% of our stuff with electrons, I'm very excited by wind farms and solar farms and all the other alternative uh, sources of, of creating electricity, but we don't. In between here and there, we would have an enormous infrastructure build-out program, trillions and trillions, to upgrade our, our electrical grid, to you know, create the electrical motors, to, you know, all the capital that would go into that, but we're not there yet. So here we are at this interesting moment in history where since 2005 we have not managed somehow to grow our crude oil uh, liquid fuel supply. And this is despite uh, oil rising, you know, tripling in price from, from uh, there to here. And so, you know, normal economics dictates say, well, listen, when prices go up, supplies follow along with that. We've had tremendous market pressure saying get more oil out of the ground and we haven't been able to do it. 
So there's a couple of reasons that might be. We might blame it on politics. It might be geopolitical in nature. It might be because, you know, we've got poor policies. It might be because of Libya. You know, we can make up a lot of excuses, but we've never seen a period of history ever in the oil data where prices have risen this much and supply hasn't followed. So another view of that, one that we should possibly consider, is that there's another explanation, which is we can't grow that stuff uh, as we've uh, done in the past because the easy, cheap uh, oil is gone. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. So I won't review all of that. I know the presentation you just saw went through a lot of that. What I'd like to do is just ask the question, what happens to our economy, which is really hooked on growth, when it no longer has access to the types of fuels around which it's built its entire mechanism of growth? And whether that's the roadways, think of all the embedded infrastructure, right? It's the roadways, it's where we grow our food and how far we have to transport it. It's the type of transportation modes we've got out there, the 200 million cars that are out there you know, on the road that all run on liquid fuels, whether it's the roadways, whatever. I mean, everything that you can look at and you ask the question, how are liquid fuels involved? The answer is everything. All right, so here we are. We're a nation that currently imports two-thirds of its liquid fuel needs. Uh, world competition for the dwindling remaining resources out there is getting quite intense. Um, we're already seeing that in price pressures, which, you know, oil at, at uh, $80 a barrel is much higher than you would predict um, at the current state of economic uh, health in the world. Um, but it's something you would predict if you were saying, hmm, maybe even despite the fact that world economic demand is, is down due to um, poor growth prospects at this point, yet we're still seeing high prices, that fits as well. We have all this confirmatory evidence that fits with the idea, the proposition that we are at a peak plateau of oil production. And so, so that's really the, the fundamental question before us, and it's a little bit of, a, of a, uh, a meditative question when I ask, you know, what are the implications of an economy that needs to grow no longer being able to grow? And I believe the answer to that is found in the newspapers that you read on a daily basis, hopefully. You're reading about how the Greece crisis is just seems uncontrollable. There's now the sovereign debt crisis that's that we don't know what to do with all across Europe. The United States is mired in very high unemployment and just can't, you know, an extra trillion dollars of stimulus doesn't seem to be doing the trick. We're waving our magic fiscal and monetary wands left and right. We're dumping money into markets and nothing is happening. And there's one reason for that might be that we're simply facing structural and probably permanent headwinds over here from the energy sector not necessarily in total millions of barrels per day consumed, but the net energy that's available to society out of those millions of barrels, because it's the net energy that we care about. Net meaning we take some oil or energy to go and get some more oil or energy. Um, what's the, the, the difference between those two? Because it's the net energy that's available to us, right? So if we took a barrel to find a barrel, there's zero extra net energy. There's nothing to use to grow food, transport it, make clothes, go to concerts, any of that, right? So we care about the net energy, and uh, everything you've read about from, uh, you know, coal to liquids, uh, that's, that's not even online, but it's coming up, or the uh, Athabasca tar, tar sands or tar shales or even these, uh, you know, the new fracking for uh, uh, the, the natural gas that, that they've gotten, like the Marcella shales or all these other things that you're reading about, every one of those requires a huge amount of capital, of embodied energy compared to what we used to get. And that investment of energy simply means there's less available net energy to come out for us to use as we wish. It's just like uh, you have a budget at home and you're spending 14% on, on energy. Next year it goes up to 20%. Well, you have 6% less to spend on other things um, because that, that part is being eaten into by uh, rising energy costs. That's the world we live in. And that's the world that's going to be with us for quite a while if, if the way I've laid things out is true, and other people as well, but that's, this is my uh, analytical framework for the moment, and it informs my investing standpoint, it informs my life decisions. It's really big, giant, uh, once in a species kind of a shift we're under, it's a paradigm shift, and um, that's in a nutshell the, the view I hold at this point. Hi, Dr. Mortensen, I have just a question, what do you think about what's going on in Israel in terms of the, the better place concept and building out sort of a battery a sustained um, transportation system? Well, transportation is, is one of the most important ways that we ever use um, uh, uh, electricity, uh, all forms of energy, um, but particularly electricity if we can get there. The idea is, is, is pretty simple that, that uh, if you're going to, um, uh, there's two ways to approach this. One is to 
find more efficient ways to move yourself around, and the second is to find ways that you don't have to move yourself around quite as much. Uh, clearly, it's that latter proposition that I think has, has the greater currency as we go forward. There are only so many efficiency improvements you can make. They tend to be incremental. If you can get a 2 or 3% efficiency improvement in the aerodynamic drag of a car, you're doing really, really well at this point in time. Uh, the Carnot efficiency cycle in engines has not been exceeded or really improved in decades. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a constant that we can't seem to get around. So, so uh, given the fact that you know, we're facing multiple percentage decreases in available net energy going forward, uh, what we're really going to be needing to do is finding ways to save and conserve uh, as first-order approximations of the solution rather than getting out there and trying to make better technologies, which has a role, but that shouldn't be your first uh, thrust in this whole thing. Uh, the first thrust really has to be around how you're going to um, create your living environment so that you are minimizing transportation and still enjoying all of the same things that we enjoy currently, but without needing to move things hundreds of miles or kilometers or however you measure it. Hello, Mr. Martinson. I have one question. Why all these things uh, happen so fast? Because just uh, 15 years ago, the, uh, the price of oil actually was quite low. And now, just in the recent five years, it's uh, already increased by three times. And why all these things happen so suddenly, without any any sign before uh, before the historic price in this year? So it, if it was a little faint, um, so for the next question, if it could be louder, that would be helpful. If I understand it, the question is why why are these things happening so suddenly? Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, my, my view on that is, is that uh, we don't live in a linear world, meaning you know, we don't go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. We live in a nonlinear world. So we're increasing our population by some percentage every year. We're increasing our economy by some percentage every year. We're increasing our levels of indebtedness by some percentage, our monetary base by some percentage. Anytime you increase anything by some percentage, you're living in an exponential world. And uh, the thing about exponential um, uh, 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 formulas and, and features of, of exponential uh, types of behaviors is that uh, because they're nonlinear, they, they tend to really uh, accelerate towards the end. Uh, things get really fast. One feature of exponential functions is, is they speed up, particularly at the end. And we're not facing just one exponential um, uh, feature here. We've got multiple trends that are all exponential, all converging on this window of time, which I'll call, say, the next 10 years or so. So, so one thing that in, in part of my framework of how I, how I invest and look at things and do everything is around the idea that um, things are going to speed up and that when things happen, they're going to happen for reasons that are fundamentally unpredictable. Because another feature of our whole system is that it's a complex system. Our economy is complex. I know you've taken a lot of economics. It looks fairly straightforward. They've got little two-dimensional graphs. You put your supply curve here. You put your demand curve there. It's all very two-dimensional. Unfortunately, the reality is that's not true. Our economy is a highly complex system, and complex systems have a couple of features that, we can, that, are, that are, you can just take to the bank. And the first is that they're completely unpredictable. That's, that's just a known feature of them. Even if you have something really simple, famous set of experiments by some physicists, um, PAK, Pack and this other guy, right? they, they, they were piling up sand trying to ask the question, when, you drop, when can we predict when you drop that next grain of sand on, is the whole pile going to you know, slump, you know, what, when do you hit that, that tipping point? So they built a computer program, because it took too much time to actually do it, you know, by hand. So they built a computer program to exactly model what happens when you pile up sand. And they ran these experiments millions of times. And they found, much to their chagrin, because they modeled the system so well, that they could never predict when or by how much their little, uh, uh, you know, theoretical piles of sand would collapse. They couldn't figure it out. What they could figure out is that they could map that there would be fingers of instability that would start to appear in their computer model, where, where parts of the face of the sand pile would get a little bit steeper, and, and they would color those red, and then other areas that weren't at critical degrees of slope would, would be green, and they would watch these red and these green sort of fingers sort of appear across their pile, and then at some moment, uh, they would, they would, the, the pile would slump. And similarly, we have an economy that has that same sort of set of feedback loops built into it. It's got critical degrees of, of slopiness to it here and there. It's a nonlinear system, and all of it's interacting in real time. And so the bottom line, one of the things that I, I truly try and, and, and 
tell, get, you know, communicate to the world is that we live in a complex system, meaning that we can do our level best to mitigate risks, we can do our level best to try and control things, we can uh, affect whatever policies make sense to us at the time, but that ultimately how things really turn out, when, where, and how things unfold is ultimately unpredictable. And these are things that we need to be more and more aware of, because while we can't tell when, where, or exactly what's going to happen, we can look at and, and map these fingers of instability, these so-called red zones that might happen. For me, those happen to be things like um, the demographic profile in our country that was going to start applying all sorts of pressures um, on the workforce on one end to Social Security on the other end. I'm looking at oil, peak oil, rising energy prices, that BTU, cost for BTU headwind coming in from the other side. We've got uh, the 30-year experiment in indebtedness that uh, was as really as, as thoroughly historically unprecedented. Um, you know, where it wasn't just federal indebtedness, it's not, that, that's a component, but I'm talking total credit market debt for the United States, uh, rising to 380% of GDP, never been in that territory before, unknowable impacts uh, if that um, credit pile, not if, when, that credit pile de delivers in some way. Um, so when we look at all of these various forces and some other ones, I, I, I won't go into in the interest of time right now, but I'm cataloging all of these red fingers of instability saying, I don't know what's going to happen and when. I do know for a fact, though, that each one of these is raising the risks that something bad is going to happen, bad meaning you know, disruptive to our financial system, our economic system, maybe our living standards, possibly by repercussion through our political system. Who knows? Um, these are fundamentally unknowable, but what we can do is we can look at the risks. And the risk of peak oil is one of the largest and I think least well-examined risks that's on our radar screen here in the United States. And by way of example, not one, zero, exactly zero federal agencies have a liquid fuel emergency plan on their books anywhere. The Department of Energy doesn't have one. The uh, Department of Agriculture doesn't have one, even though if you don't have liquid fuels, you are not growing crops, right? They have all kinds of – Department of Agriculture, they have, they have biocontagion risks plans. They've got uh, seed shortage plans. They've got, um, you know, weather-related plans. Uh, how can you not have a liquid fuels emergency plan? Uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security has 33 separate risks that they are mitigating and controlling and have plans for people working on. Liquid fuels emergency isn't one of them. So here we are in this country facing the idea that we have literally no plan B, zero, at the official planning level, at least what's publicly known about it. There are private plans you know, that we haven't seen that that's something else I don't know about. But publicly, zero plan Bs at this point for the idea that we might be facing structurally rising uh, liquid fuel prices that could morph into actual physical shortages. It's an enormous risk to our everything, and we don't have a plan for it. Whereas in Europe, uh, maybe a little, little further along, they're actually talking about it. They've got policy committees. Uh, Sweden actually has a plan for getting completely import independent from oil by 2020 through conservation and efficiency uh, programs. They're, they're, it's actually a, an official act of the country to recognize peak oil and do something about it um, in advance. So this isn't like you know wacky conspiracy stuff that, that just a few people are, are sort of spinning around. Whole governments are, are reorganizing their policies and plans around it. It's just in this country, we're not really taking it seriously yet, um, and, and that's a mysterious, uh, mysterious thing to me. Uh, I, was just, uh, I interviewed David Stockman this morning for a podcast and asked him this exact question, like, why aren't we taking this seriously? And, and he was really at a loss to understand uh, why that would be as well, except that it's just you know, business as usual right now it doesn't really have room for um, you know, taking on an, another uh, you know, giant kind of ideas, particularly if it doesn't have political currency um, for the 2012 election cycle, and so uh, you know, he was he, he he saw political reasons why we weren't taking this on. And if that's the case, you know, my my admonition here would be, you know, individuals, corporations uh, should not be waiting for uh, our government to be taking the lead to let us know this is a serious crisis or a concern or a risk that we should be mitigating. That this really then falls upon us to look at the data, assess it, decide what makes sense. Um, move forward from there. But um, you know, thanks for the question. Uh, speeding up is absolutely something that we would both predict and expect from a complex system that has multiple exponential curves, uh, all sort of meeting up in a, in a very skinny window of time. So it seems like over the past couple of years, um, there have been more discoveries of um, 
more oil in the ground. And you mentioned two um, technologies, one being converting uh, more transportation or more of our energy needs to electricity, and the other being um, working on technology to get more oil out of the ground, more net uh, energy, like you said, um, out of the ground, either through fracking or oil sands. Um, which, which one of those two ways do you see developing more quickly, and, and which do you think will gain ground uh, quicker? Well, the thing that, that's most, uh, that we really have to keep our eyes on most is not the total amount of oil coming out of the ground. It's how much is, comes out of the ground and then goes into the export market. You know, it doesn't really matter if the world produces 100 million barrels a day or 50 million barrels. Currently, it's standing at around 86. It doesn't really matter what the number is. Um, if it turns out there's zero available on the export market, you know, that, that's what we care about in this country and, and how many countries are now import-dependent, um, quite a few, uh, not, not just the United States. So um, what we really care about is, is how much is available out there. And so what we're, what, what's really of interest to us beyond net energy then as well, although that's an underlying fundamental concern, the next one up is, is what are the flow rates that we can expect from from these new fines, uh, you know, so there was a big 30 gigabarrel fine down in Brazil, the Tupi salt fields, you know, it's, it's a giant fine, but hey, it's 26,000 feet down, it's, it has to go through a mile of molten salt, it's, it's got some challenges, so getting the flow rates out of that 30 gigabarrels is going to, trust me, it will be a lot less and, um, than we would get out of a 30 gigabarrel fine that was, say, a 1,000 feet down under the, under the sands of Texas. Uh, so when we look at any of these new areas around there, you know, we can't just look at the total amounts that are there. Oh, there's 200 gigabarrels of, you know, in the tar sands. That's wonderful, but how fast can you shovel that stuff out, put it into a truck, drive the truck to the processing plant, tip the truck into the hopper, have that thing all be heated up with some water, skim off this, this bitumen, which isn't oil, run that bitumen into a treatment plant so that you can um, you know, use natural gas to uh, put some hydrogen on it, crack it, and, and turn it into a synthetic fuel. The question is, how fast can you do that? How many million barrels a day? What is the capital required in order to make that transition? The answer is that almost all of the new fines that we've got out there, um, with the exception of the fracking, which seems to be a, a, fairly, a fairly robust technology that has really nice returns to it um, at, at present, uh, but beyond that, most of the new finds that we're seeing all have really uh, what we would consider by historical standards um, really exceptionally high capital costs and really abysmal flow rates. It's the flow rates we care about and the net energy. It's those two pieces. It's the quantity of oil and if I could use quality as the, as the cue descriptor for net energy, quantity and quality. The, both of those are uh, really quite anemic on almost every new, you know, non-conventional play, be that deep water, the oil belt, uh, the Orinoco belt down in Venezuela, the tar sands, uh, you know, you're hear, hearing more about oil shales. We're not even getting any oil out of oil shales yet, um, uh, you know. In, uh, so at any rate, uh, these are all things that, that we, can, we can look at, but I personally would not want to um, construct my energy policy around hoping that those unconventional plays were going to be the ones that were going to allow the quantity and quality issues to be solved. In conjunction with that, prime is in, in, you know, in front of that, you have to have a credible plan for how you're going to use what resources you have far more effectively and efficiently. The companies that do that better, the countries that do that better, the individuals that do that better, I think are the ones who are going to win in the future. Um, you know, uh, if we're going to pin our hopes on business as usual, we'll, we'll magically be very clever and find ways to be get both quantity and quality up out of existing plays that we know about. I think the risk of disappointment in that is, is uncomfortably high for me and uh, hopefully, you know, for other people as well. Dr. Martinson, uh, the Department of Energy recently uh, released a report saying that by 2035, the U.S. will produce 2 million barrels per day. and they currently uh, produce 50% of their needs, and the other is supplied by um, imports. But they say that this will actually build, actually be less dependent on imports because of the increase domestically of production. Um, is this, I mean, is this generally accurate? What what Department of Energy is is predicting, or is this part of that sort of misconstrued, misinformed public information that is feeding the same problems you're talking about? Yeah, there's there's a, the biggest. Most glaring um, problem with that particular report is that they're double counting, uh, and I really, really disagree with with uh, one part of this. So um, first, they, they count the let, here's the here's the example. First, they count the amount of diesel that we produce, right? So we produce some some crude, and then we put it into a refinery, and then diesel and gasoline and other components come out. But they, they measure the diesel like, look, 
you know, 100 million barrels of, of diesel coming out. That's that we count that. And then we take that same 100 million barrels of diesel and we run it over into the, some farms, and then we use it to grow corn, which then we use to turn it to corn ethanol. And then they count all the corn ethanol that comes out of that process and say, look, there's a billion a billion gallons of ethanol too. So we'll add that to the mix. Um, you can pick one of those two things to count, but you can't do both because the energy conversion is almost one-to-one. We take one unit of diesel and we get one unit of, of ethanol energy out of it. Um, and so they've been stacking uh, what they're looking at as growth in biofuels and adding that as barrel of oil equivalents into the overall pie and saying, look, the pie is getting bigger. Um, but it's, it's really bad accounting. Uh, so, so that's one, one error they've got. Um, the second is that they, I think, are really, really, really being overly generous with um, the decline rates in our existing fields. Uh, you know, they're assuming a relatively low 2 or 3 percent decline rate, but we're seeing much, much more rapid decline rates, especially for the offshore fines, which for whatever reasons decline much more rapidly, 6, 8, 10 percent uh, decline rates per year. Um, so, uh, you know, we're seeing that with, with the Alaska fields at this point in time. There's a huge problem going on because there's this trans-Alaska pipeline, comes out of the Prudhoe field, goes down, uh, offloads at the Kenai Peninsula, right? And so we need that oil to go from point A to point B so it can get on tankers and, and get to the rest of the world. Um, at the current rate of decline in the Prudhoe Bay fields, there won't be enough oil to feed into the pipeline because it comes out of the ground hot, to feed into the pipeline so that pipeline can run continuously because in winter, it, you know, the, the oil starts hot and, you know, if they race it down there in a full pipeline, it comes out, you know, cool but, but not, you know, frozen, not sludge. Um, there's real deep concern now about how they're going to keep that pipeline open uh, with the amount of oil that they've got coming out of there. And if that uh, piece shut down, we would have a, a, an enormous hit to uh, U.S. production figures, uh, you know, at least during the cold months. So, so these are, there's some real realities in there. I, I think, you know, the DOE report was, was taking a very favorable view, um, uh, but they've always done that. So that's one of those reports where it's best to look at it squint and just lop a couple of a couple of percent off or, or whatever you're comfortable doing um, because they've been uh, overly uh, sanguine about everything from prices to amounts of oils uh, you know pr- products uh, for as long as I've been tracking them uh, dr. Martinson so I guess it, it kind of seems like there's there's two problems there's the transition issue from changing from uh, liquid fuel based economy um, getting off of that huge capital structure and then transitioning onto a long run you know whatever it's going to be you know cold fusion <laughs> who knows I guess so what I guess what is your recommendation how do we handle that transition and what do you really feel is the long run end game well it, whether we whether we choose to face it or not it's going to happen um, is it, my view so that's sort of like uh, I've got this this scientific reality base view, which is that if you don't have the BTUs, you don't have them. Um, and, and so we will be making the transition. If I were going to wave my magic policy wand, currently we happen to have a lot of natural gas resources in this country. We don't really have a way to use them yet. We don't have the pipelines there. If you decided to have a, a compressed natural gas car, a CNG car, you bought it today, and um, you're driving around Ithaca and you say, I'm going to go fill this up. You know, try and find a filling station that's got a, a CNG terminal for you to use as a private citizen. Um, you probably won't find one. And uh, that's true all across the country. So, so that's not a big deal, right? All we have to do is put CNG filling stations at all our current filling stations, right, as we transition. Well, think about that. You, know, uh, you probably don't have the pipelines coming to your region, so we'd have to lay pipelines, and individual pipelines have to be set to all of the individual um, filling stations, and then they have to have compression technology there. And then they have to have some, you know, safe way of, of allowing private individuals to refill their own, <coughs> own vehicles. This is a, you know, this is a little, this compressed natural gas is not quite the same beast as liquid fuel. It's a little bit more explosive, you know, there's more, ex, there's extra safeguards. So, so there's just a huge build out just to, you know, get the gas out of the ground, first of all, put it in pipelines, get it to the distribution point where we could use it in a, in a whole percentage point kind of a way where it's going to take over whole percentage points of market capture from liquid fuels, right? If we want 10% of our fleet running on CNG, if we want 40%, 50%, we could do that. But the capital build-out is going to be extraordinary. Um, and so I think that's coming, and I think that represents a growth opportunity uh, for the future. Um, it, it's just not something we've actually currently started on. Uh, I believe if we wait for market forces to deliver that, uh, 
it'll never happen because you know uh, all these pipelines have to go from point A to point B, which means they have to cross multiple states, multiple jurisdictions. Everybody hates putting pipelines in. NIMBY rules. You'll be tied up in regulatory permitting processes for decades if you're a company trying to go from, say, uh, a gas field in Pennsylvania to a market in Boston. Um, you know, you got to go to four states to get there. Uh, it's not going to work out probably, or three states depending on how you route it. So. Um, uh, so this is where I think we're going to have to, you know, we would need some kind of coordinated, official government sort of a policy that says, like the, like the national highway system, this is something we're doing, people, you know, eminent domain, the whole nine yards. We're going to be a little rough about this, but it's happening. Uh, that would have to happen in order for us to make use of that resource in a transitionary phase. Coupled to that, we'd have to say, listen, we just can't be driving – you know, uh, you know, grapes 3,000 miles, you know, just that doesn't make sense to us as much anymore or, or something. We'd have to find some way of becoming far more effective in how we move stuff around. That means the rail system. That means barge systems instead of uh, using trucks um, for everything but the last mile, which is what we should use trucks for, the last mile, right? But, but the first 1,000 miles ought to be on, on rail because it's, it's, you know, whatever it is, 30 times more efficient than trucks. It's, it's phenomenal. So, so there are things we can and should be doing, but we haven't even begun to take the infrastructure steps necessary to do that, upgrading our rail lines, um, thinking about the capital we're going to appropriate into this area, you know, dedicating things towards research and development. None of that is happening on what I consider to be a credible scale. You know, in the last stimulus bill, there was $8 billion for a high-speed rail. And what they decided to do with that $8 billion was they're going to connect two relatively meaningless towns in California in the, in the Central Valley region. For, that's it. Really? That, that's our high-speed rail, uh, and, and there we're just trying to move people. That's not the sort of issues we're facing. There's, there's a giant gap between the world that you just explored in the presentation before and what our official responses are at this point. We could make, I think, a relatively smooth transition. We won't be doing it where we preserve everything we currently know and love about how we move things around uh, currently. Um, we can do it with, uh, with grace and style and, and ways that I think are full of purpose and meaning and create a lot of jobs. We won't get there if we wait for market forces to do it alone, because by the time the market is sending signals, let's call that $10 a gallon gasoline, there will no longer be the private capital available uh, it, it to really dedicate the trillions and trillions it would require <coughs> to transition smoothly. So there is enormous opportunity here. There's also enormous risk, and the risk is that we fiddle around and waste time uh, as we fail to sort of heed what the warning signs are. Because by the time we're hip deep in a liquid fuels emergency, whether that's through pricing or actual scarcity, doesn't matter. Probably both together if you get scarcity. Um, by the time we're in the midst of that crisis, we're going to find that there's very, very little actual additional capital out in society, whether through taxation or additional borrowing in the bond markets or wherever that's going to come from. Um, there's going to be relatively small amounts of capital left to do the things we need to do. So, so the, the, the clever way to do this would be to rewind the clock back to 1956 when Admiral Hyman Rickover, um, father of the nuclear sub and the nuclear navy, uh, you know, arguably one of the smartest guys ever to work in, in that, that capacity, gave almost exactly the talk you just heard today uh, to a group of physicians. So it, this, this has been known about for a very long time. Um, certainly our next opportunity would have been when Carter put on the cardigan and gave the whole, a very actually very prescient speech in uh, April of 1977 saying, look, if we don't solve our energy crisis, someday we're going to get hit with a, a big ugly stick, to paraphrase. Um, and, and so here we are, you know, having basically ignored this for a, a large number of decades. Um, so right now our most valuable resource is time. We really are going to need time. These infrastructure build-outs take time, decades, literally decades. Um, quick example, if we said every single car in America today, starting tomorrow, because we waved a magic wand, starting tomorrow, there are only electric vehicles available for sale. That's it. But we're going to allow people to, to wear out their existing cars, and, but the next car that's bought, that has to be an electric car. It'll take 10 years to swap out half the fleet following that model. So that's just letting normal market forces, you know, your embedded capital in the vehicle you already own, not telling you that's, that's trash and you have to throw that away because, you know, we're going to force you to buy an electric car and trash your other one. Um, allowing normal market forces to, to, to uh, work through the system without um, taking embedded capital and destroying it uh, just takes time. And so if, if the peak oil view is correct and we are, you know, either at the plateau or very shortly to be in the plateau, even if we're 10 years from the plateau, there's more oil out there than we thought, 
we're still behind the eight ball in this one. We need to get busy in a real hurry uh, in order to avoid what I would consider to be pretty significant disruptions to our way of life, standard of living, expectations of the future, all kinds of things. Uh, it's a pretty serious challenge. Hi, Dr. Martinson. Um, I have a more uh, abstract question, if you will, going back to your um, comment about um, the question you posed to us at the beginning, being more meditative. Um, in terms of, you suggested that, that you think it's more of a structural change that needs to happen in this economy that's um, founded on constant growth. And how do you see that happening with given all of these um, circumstances that you've laid out? And it seems like you're more of a prophetic voice of like, look at what's going on right now. Um, so how do you see this fundamental change in framework of the, our economy happening? So the, the, well, the fundamental changes are already kind of underway. Um, I, I alluded to it at the beginning, which is that uh, it's really our monetary system that requires uh, growth. Not requires in a legal sense, I mean, but requires it like my body requires oxygen. Uh, without growth, our monetary system really behaves um, rather poorly. And so, so we, have, we have an opportunity, though. Here's the thing. Here's the funny thing. We don't have to loan money into existence. That's how we do it currently, right? So the, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 chartered a private institution to manage our monetary system for us, and, and we put some political firewalls between current politics and our money system, which, which made a lot of sense at the time, and, and so now we have this private institution out there doing that. But when you take a dollar bill out of your pocket and you look at it, it says Federal Reserve note on it. It doesn't say Treasury note. It doesn't say anything like that. Our private money in this country is issued by essentially a private bank, and it's loaned to us. Not a lot, but, you know, it's loaned. Um, and so every dollar in existence, it doesn't matter where it is in the system, has an equal offsetting loan somewhere else in the system. Um, so that's what we do. We just loan all our money into existence. And so one possible way that we could very rapidly get around that is there's no, there's no reason at all that the private money of this country has to be loaned into existence. There's no reason for the Treasury Department. There's no legal reason. There's no... There's no, there's no um, uh, other reason, you know, even theoretical that I can think of, why the Treasury Department, instead of going to the bond market and borrowing $100 billion, wouldn't just print that same money and put it out into the open, open space with, with no, no, no interest requirement attached to it, which is really what's, what's driving that growth. Money is a commodity. It, it, it's, it's a medium of exchange. That's all it is. And uh, so there's really no logical sound reason why our money system has to be based on something that requires growth. Uh, we, that's the one we currently happen to have. Not just we, I mean, it, literally every single country in, on the face of the planet has the same currency system at this point. But that's a relatively recent modern invention. Um, and it's also important to chase down that, that the full uh, free floating exchange rate system is, uh, is only, uh, can be dated to August of 1971. That's where we really uh, tossed the last vestige of a gold standard, the international gold settlement system. Um, and so this is what we've been on. It's about just over 40 years now of, of operating with a system. And guess what? As predicted by a number of very uh, you know, intelligent people, even back then when, when that gold system was abandoned, um, you know, there is uh, what we're going to – what the prediction was, there were going to be structural imbalances that would just grow over time. These would be current account deficit imbalances. These would be uh, currency manipulations by central banks as they all try and manage their currencies rather than letting true market forces uh, determine what – what the uh, uh, price of that money ought to be, et cetera, and so forth. Here we are. You know, we are at, at the end of about 40 years of experimenting with a system that arguably has, has never really worked all that well ever, and, and we're facing those same imbalances now. And at the core of that, though, at the very core of that is this idea that we've, we've all agreed that our money has to be backed by debt. That's what it's backed by now. It's not backed by gold. It's not even really backed by oil in the case of the U.S. dollar. It's backed by debt. That's great as long as your debt can constantly grow. Um, if your debt can't constantly grow, you have a problem. Well, any sixth grader can tell you that nothing can grow forever. Sooner or later, you have a, you have a problem in that story. And I submit to you that that problem, or I'm going to call it a predicament actually, being a little bit more serious than a problem, because predicaments don't have solutions. They have outcomes. We're going to have to manage the outcomes now of, of the idea of transitioning away from a system that was based on infinite growth that is now running into some really solid fundamental um, 
structural headwinds, whether they're purely economic in nature, there's only so, so long you can grow your debt at a higher rate than your income. That's what we've been doing in this country. When you look at um, debt to GDP being 160% in 1970, going all the way to 380% today, that's total credit market debt, not, that, not, not just the federal number you've been hearing about. So we went from a, a ratio of 1.6 to 3.8, you know, a full doubling of that. We've been growing debt way faster than income. Just economically, leave energy out of it, leave anything else I've talked about. Anybody can tell you you can't grow your debt faster than your income forever. <coughs> Sooner or later, there's a problem there or a predicament. So, so that's, you know, but that is a very predictable outcome of what happened, and I picked 1970 for a reason. That's very, care, you know, that, that's a predictable outcome of what happens when you untether your economic system and your monetary system from any sort of restraints, and, and you just allow political will uh, to sort of dictate how much money you want to create. And we've been doing that, and all the world's central banks have been participating. Um, you look at the growth in reserve balances at central banks all across the world. They've been growing by anywhere from 18 to 24 percent per year for the past decade. Unbelievable rates of compounding. So the United States issues too much debt. The Bank of Japan or or, or China vacuums up, um, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, that's been going on for a long time. And uh, it, it, David Stockman made the the, the <laughs> comment. This he, he looks at it, and I see the same thing. He says, that game's over. It's shifting. And if we really wanted to be honest about it, what we would do is we would say the flaw, such as it is, is not embedded in a political will or lack of will. It's not embedded in policies. It's not, it's not a monetary tweak that we failed to make. It's really fundamentally about how we uh, have constructed our monetary system at its core. That's the, that's the key flaw. You can go into any one of the original... Um, uh, religious texts uh, from way back when, and you'll find the same admonitions against usury and um, things called debt jubilees, which were an understanding that if you were going to run a, an interest-based monetary system, a jubilee was where uh, all the debt would be wiped out after seven periods of seven. They would have a 49-year run, uh, and they said that's about how long you can run a compounding interest-based system because the thing just goes funky on you, and so you're going to need a jubilee at the end. Um, so, so we've had multiple, multiple experiences through history. History is just absolutely chock full of, of warning tales around the idea that when you run interest-based monetary systems, they get funky on you. And that's the world that we happen to be living in, and it's why we're going to throw trillions of dollars into uh, the monetary system, and it's not going to behave as we expected. The, the unemployment's still high. Wait, what's happening to final demand? Why aren't loans being made? These are all very confusing things if you hold the view that um, – uh, is currently held by the, the Federal Reserve, but if you have a different view, which is that this is what the predictable outcome of a of a monetary system uh, that we've got it would be, then a lot of these things make sense. Um, and so the good news is, uh, for me, is that you know this has formed a, a very successful way to structure and organize everything from my career to my my finances, as I've mentioned. So so this is. To me, there's nothing truly surprising here um, in, in overall scope, although the details have been surprising, the timing has been surprising. Of course, it's a complex system, so I'm, I'm prepared to be surprised in those things. But the overall sweep of it is not surprising. Chris, do you have uh, maybe a chance for two more questions? Uh, actually, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, uh, it's 11.17. You know what, I'm going to have to actually uh, wrap it up here. Okay. Do you have any final advice? You have a room full of MBAs here. Maybe final advice for people going into management uh, of, of how they should approach this megatrend of peak oil? Well, it, it has as much opportunity as it does challenges. But, you know, so the, the, the advice is relatively simple, which is that um, companies are careers that are based on what I'm going to call business as usual, which is as long as everything's expanding, they're, they're relatively happy. Um, when things are contracting, they're very unhappy. Uh, the financial services industry, Wall Street, all of that, uh, it, without expansion, those are, are rather unhappy places to work um, in, in general. So the idea here is that uh, to really take a good, hard look at and ask the question around how is this company, how is this opportunity really positioned for this new reality? And uh, that's not an easy question to, to answer. Uh, there won't be any definitive answers, but you will have a gut instinct as to, you know, some businesses are going to be more well positioned than others. There's always going to be an economy. Always. People have needs. They will get filled. Uh, the question is how and, and who's going to be standing there to do that. And, and the companies, countries, counties, communities, any of those things that will be better positioned than others are going to be the ones um, 
that are more resilient, that are not solely singularly exposed to um, you know any particular one aspect of the energy market, uh, you know, like uh, airlines really heavily exposed to the price of liquid fuels. Um, you know, that, that's a, a tricky place to work in a rising uh, fuel environment. So, so that's, that's part one. And then part two is just is based more on my own personal experience, which is that whatever you do, you should really be following your heart. Jobs with purpose are jobs that um, are just much, much more rewarding than jobs that pay a lot. And when I first came out of school, I was looking for a job that paid a lot. Found it. That was all well and good. Um, and now I'm involved in something that has a lot of purpose to me. And uh, that is pretty much priceless at this point in time. I truly believe that material wealth is, is going to be shifting back towards other forms of, of identifiable wealth. And, and uh, those who, who can be resilient in what they consider wealth are, I think, better positioned than the rest. Dr. Smartson, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Goodbye.